Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Perspectives from the Field Interactive Talk Show. My name is Elizabeth Siri. I'm the Executive Director of Development and Communications for Foundations, Inc. And I just want to welcome everybody to our show today. We've got a great episode for you on creativity and empowerment. And in this episode, we are going to explore youth empowerment through the arts, digital media, through building a sense of community and belonging. So we're so happy that you joined us. I'd like to introduce our host, Sean Petty. He is a training and development manager at Westat and also a White Riley Peterson Policy Fellow. And our special guests, Andrea Gates Ingle and Stephen Ingle, who are the co-founders of Creative Kids from El Paso, Texas. Thank you all for joining us. We couldn't do this webinar series without our sponsor, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. So we also want to give them a shout out as well. And you may already know Foundations Inc. from our signature professional learning event, the Beyond School Hours Conference. You can join us February 23rd through the 26th in 2022 in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Sean, Andrea, and Stephen will be there for our live interactive talk show. And we hope that you all take some time and join us in Orlando. We're so excited to be back in person again. It's a three and a half day professional learning event. And we bring in educators from across the country for networking, skills, workshops, it's, it's a great event. So we hope you will consider joining us. Um, but without further ado, I would like to turn everything over to Sean to get things started today. Thanks for being here, Sean. Perfect, thank you so much, Elizabeth, uh, for welcoming us. We were trying to figure out what to officially uh, call Elizabeth as the leader of our event today, like is she a master of ceremonies? So if anybody knows, please put in the chat room because we'd love to uh, be able to use the right terminology, I guess. But we're so excited that you're all here. Um, we're so excited to be getting back together, hopefully in February in Orlando. It's gonna be beautiful, a lot of great things uh, happening. And we have an amazing show for you today. We have two very, very special individuals on the line who do amazing work. They're gonna share a little bit about their organization. They're gonna share a little bit about their thoughts about youth development, about empowering youth, um, just so many things and so many good stuff. So let me, without further ado, introduce our guest. Um, if I may, I, may I call you guys just the Ingles or um, dynamic duo? I don't know, you guys are so amazing. Well, when they say the Ingalls, they always think Little House on the Prairie. So, I, I mean, whatever you want to do. Oh, my gosh, you're dating me a little bit. Like, I know that. Yeah. Well, um, so excited to have you back. For those on the show who may not know, we did a, um, gosh, when was it? When was it last February that we did our um, kind of a uh, tour, walkthrough idea, kind of a concept? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, and we had such a great time that I was like, we have to do this again. And thankfully, uh, Steve and Andrea were willing to do that, which we appreciate. And I understand you're going to share a little bit about um, kind of the art pieces that you're working on. So uh, the kids are working on your program. Um, we we're going to have an opportunity to take a walk through of your gallery, which is going to be so exciting. And then um, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about some documentaries that you have and some videos that you have, and even wrap up with this new amazing platform that you've created, new amazing technology that allows us to actually bring your program into our homes, so to speak, or into our programs if we can. So I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going to be quiet and let you guys go ahead and just kick us off by telling us a little bit about your organization and yourselves. Yeah, so like uh, 25 years ago, these two college students had a crazy idea. She was a special ed teacher and I was an artist here at UTEP in El Paso. And we combined our talents to really work with kids that had special needs and, and any environment, you know, it was housing authorities, it was working with kids that were battling some at-risk situations. And over these 25 years, we have just built something that we're so proud of and brings us happiness but it is turned into something that's good for everybody involved. So, so you're, oh, I'm so sorry. I just have to ask. So wait a minute. You actually, so you met in college? Yeah. And yeah. after 25 years, you're still together? We're still married. Can you believe it? And we work together. Side and by side. we work together. That's how much we love each other. 
Yes. And that's why when I had everyone complaining during the pandemic with their spouses, I was like, please, please, please. They don't even know. Yeah, no. <laughs> run a nonprofit, be married, and then, you know, it's a beautiful. Oh, I, I love, I love my wife. I just don't think I could work every day. I mean, I love my wife, but I don't know that I could work with my partner every day like that. That So kudos to you. That's amazing in itself. Sorry. Right. Yeah, we just celebrated <laughs> our 21st wedding anniversary. So. Right. So... <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. And our little baby girl is just a, a beautiful add to the family too. So it's, it's becoming better and better is what I'm oh, saying. That, that's awesome. And not only do you, you have, you know, a child yourself, a little girl, but you also help so many kids in the El Paso area of Texas. It's like you're, you kind of have like a very large extended family. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's so funny. So this past week, um, so I just got an email from, so Steve had mentioned when we first started working with kids in the housing authority, that was well, our very first program we launched was with kids um, battling cancer, the pediatric oncology youth at Providence, which is still running today. It's our, our, our favorite, most special program. Um, and then after that, we launched a program in the housing authority. And this past week, I just got an email from one of the participants from 21 plus years ago, uh, just a beautiful long email about how that one summer with us and creative kids program has changed his life and his trajectory and you know where he should be in jail and you know it's just this beautiful note uh and just the, that's what gives us the energy and because you know there's days as everyone knows in the nonprofit world you just mm. you know you're like sometimes you're like well, I don't know if I can keep doing this and then you get these letters of you know 20 years you know later, like later of how that are still impacting their life and then Thursday night we went to dinner to support one of our local nonprofits. it was El Paso Giving Day and this uh, young man came up to us and said creative kids and then we we're like yes <laughs> he said, I was in your migrant education program back in 2009 and because of the digital media program you guys helped me with I'm now on a path with computer science and graphic design and arts and you know so it was another both the, all three of us were crying it's just, oh, yeah, I, these stories. I just bowed to him <laughs> And oh I my gosh! My day. You made my day. It's I know a, it's going to bring. I'm such a staff. It's bringing tears to my eyes just listening oh, to you. Yeah. That that was that's 12 years ago. Yeah, and so that's, just wow. to hear these stories and these people that needed it the most, which is why we founded this organization to help kids that otherwise wouldn't have this opportunity. And it was supposed to just be one summer because we were young college kids. We had no idea how to run a nonprofit, start a nonprofit. So we were just going to do a camp. And the camp is now, you know, we're almost at 25 years. So, yeah, like if you look at the logo and you see the two C's, we made mm -hmm. them because it was Creative Kids Camp. We only so thought that body is the K. And that was on a napkin Creative like 25 years ago. So we we're just lucky and in love with. What and we, we still do. have that napkin. It's actually in our office framed. We went to Chili's because it was the 90s. Hey, like, that, that was good stuff. And we like. That was good Over stuff. margaritas came up with a, the creative kids concept and we Steve sketched it on a cocktail napkin. And yeah, we actually have it framed up in our office. So yeah. life wow, is well, that's it's such a story. I mean, the the napkin, and honestly, you said 25 years. You guys look like you're 27. I mean, come on. I mean, uh, you must love what you do because you you uh you're like eternals here, so that's amazing, and I understand. Um, in addition to running uh, Creative Kids Now, a uh, nonprofit which has made it through the pandemic or through, well, still making it through the pandemic, there's still challenges, right? Um, okay. And affecting kids, you've won several awards too. Like um, you have, we have a couple of them listed here. Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, so I think the biggest award is, is what we did in healthcare with kids that were, you know, terminally ill and, and had cancer. And we mm -hmm. were addressing the families in that environment, which is very sterile giving these kids hope and outlook. Uh, and we went to the White House to receive that award from the Obamas, uh, met with them, and we are on the books in the White House for a national model dealing with art and healthcare. Um, you actually got to meet with like President Obama and uh, First Lady Obama, like Michelle Obama? Yeah, and if you go to our website, I believe it's still up, there's the picture and we were able to take two of our patients with us that were in remission and um, Denasia, you'll see her. Um, we have a, we also have a documentary up there that you will see, and it's her giving the opening ceremony speech and had Michelle Obama in tears. 
Um, but yeah, you'll see the picture with the three of us with the first lady, because this is um, this was her um, baby project. And so, yes, we and, were able to meet with them. And that initiative kind of launched us into a new platform of understanding that we could put art as a tool into all these awards. So when you look up here at TEA and the other things that we've received from the National Endowment for the Arts, it gave us the not only platform, but the belief in ourselves that we could be bigger and better to help other kids. So these are some of the awards we've received after the work we've done. And time and time again, we're just proving that art is a great educational tool and it should be used to get kids to where they need to be and find their purpose. And, and yeah, so through TEA, through the, um, the ELO committee made uh, Project ABLE, which we'll see a video um, in a little bit as a best practice model a couple of years back. So it's exciting. Awesome. I mean, yeah, it is exciting. You guys, you know, are using, using the power of art, the power of your own passion, the power of your dreams to make a difference. And I think that's why everybody on the line right now um, and everybody that will listen in later wants to do as well. Let's, let's go ahead and jump right into what you do though, because that's what you do is so exciting and I want everybody to hear because it's so cool. So our curriculum is developed from, you know, age four all the way up to 18 and even, you know, kids with uh, special needs, it might go up to 24, 25, 26. And we're working with the idea of collaborating with leadership and art. So we're teaching kids principles on, on purpose, how to outline what they like, where they should go, what their goals are, what the strategy is to get there and the steps to take. And then we partner with other nonprofits in the community to strengthen the overall outcomes of what we're trying to do for our community and anybody that partners with us. And so one of our big partnerships is with the Boys and Girls Club of El Paso. And so we're able to come together actually through the Texas ACE. Um, and we're at five different school sites um, in partnership with them. And so we're able to offer the art programming side while they do all their mentorship and the tutoring. And then there's also Kids Excel that gives the dance component. And then there's a tutoring component through Sylvan. Um, and so that's been just an incredible uh, partnership. And actually this is the work, one of the pieces that we did with the Boys and Girls this past summer, um, one of our first in-person camps since the pandemic. So. Let me get into this. This is combined effort of teamwork during the pandemic where we were actually doing Zoom calls the kids would do the activities with the mentors at the Boys and Girls Club. We were running the tool tutorials so they could go through the process. Then each one of these tiles that you see up here is combined to make this big image. This is 60 kids working together and collaborative with two nonprofit agencies that then have an outcome of not only an activity, but showing what teamwork, strategy and communication can do together. Um, but it strengthened the bond between the nonprofits. It gave the kids this esteem boost and it shows what the future of, I think, after school programming can be when we all work together. It should be. Should be, <laughs> but I think it can be. And this is proof positive that it does work. And so what we're leaning towards now is the relationships that we have in the community with higher education, with anybody, parents, school systems, just to grow that kind of idea and be open to saying, yes, what can we do together? How do we collaborate? And what would be the benefit for everybody involved with the purpose of the kids in mind? That's what we all wanna do. We wanna help our kids. Mm -hmm. So if we do it together, including the parents and the community organizations and school systems, you're gonna have a great, not only outcome, but be proud of the things you do for our kids. And so this is proof positive that we think it's, it's the future of where we want to go. That's awesome. I know Alicia's on the line from Boys and Girls Club down there um, and, and yeah. on camera. <laughs> she's kind of <laughs> looking away right now, but she's there. Um, but what I think is really cool is you were able to do this in a time when the kids were all virtual. Like a lot of programs across the nation, it was difficult, you know, when, when schools kind of shut down and we went kind of into lockdown for safety, you know, and, and in some areas we still are, you know, because of the various outbreaks of what's happening across the country, you were still able to keep the uh, passion around art, the drive to help kids, the drive to build that sense of community, that sense of accomplishment in the virtual space, right? Yeah, so actually our team is here in the background. Um, 
we have Adith and Gabby who like, you know, once the pandemic started, we never stopped. And we just, you know, we said, well, what do we do? We can't stop everything. And so these guys came together to make art kits and still are making them. But the strategy was first fear. So you get shocked, yeah. right? Oh God, <laughs> I can't provide my service. Then second is where do we pivot? So the mm -hmm. pivot was towards technology and reaching into homes. The pivot was calming our staff, finding a good way that we could rethink where we wanna be. And it was not a bad thing. Everybody was, oh, it's a bad, no, it was a great thing because we found out what we needed and what we didn't need. And we found a true purpose on how we can create the future of reaching other kids. And that means using technology, we can actually influence and help others with more of the capacity by using technology as a tool. So, and every month our program partners like the Boys and Girls Club, Fabian's ISD, you know, they would get these um, art kits that were made monthly and make sure they were distributed to every participant and they were able to tune in every week. And then we even did art um, exhibits around their work and we wanted to make sure that they weren't just making work just to like fill three hours of their day. And that's kind of what we're going to do with you when we take the tour around. We're going to do the same thing we used to do with the kids when, you know, because they need that, that reward that like I am and give yeah. them a boost. And, and I think it was something that we learned. But I think the relationships and the new strategy that came out of that. I can't be thankful enough because now we're going to go in a new position as a nonprofit. We've learned the things that we're good at and we're not going to do the things or activities that don't benefit. We're going towards the goals. So, and two of our programs, the resiliency art program, which we'll talk about in a little bit um, and Fabin's um, project table, we still have to go virtual. So we're still continuing to make those art kits, but um, Adith and Gabby, they have it down to a science and get those kicked out every month and every kid has everything they need to be successful. And the, the leadership and the communication and management that our team does has just mm -hmm. brought us tighter. So, I mean, we're all going with the same purpose and passion and it's fun to come to work. We, we always have something that we're ignited about. Um, and the new challenges just look like new opportunities. So I actually right. think going through it was a good thing. I do. What a great, what a great, great, uh, thing and I see in the chat Alicia commented that they absolutely love you because you there's a little heart thank you <laughs> for sharing because you do pivot with them and what I like is sometimes we see a little bit of competitive uh, market out there with nonprofits but I love the fact that you're looking at not just uh, like this is our piece of the pie that we do but let's grow the pie with another nonprofit you know we each have specific things that we can bring. And I, I know there are other people in the line right now. My good friend Brent uh, from Washington's here. And that's the same thing he does too with his program up there. So, I mean, um, that's amazing. But I know we have so much. I could probably just ask you questions about this one thing. But uh, please walk me through kind of some of the slides you have. Otherwise, I'll talk to you all day. Okay. Yeah, we just wanted to show um, the public art opportunities that we give our, our, our participants in the program. And so these are large scale public art permanent projects. So, so again, this is a partnership with the local water, water utility here in El Paso. They gave us the funding. We brought the talent and our kids. But now our kids have a mark in El Paso that they'll never forget. And it's a landmark in our community that shows the talent of our kids, what they built, and their parents themselves, they stand up taller just from doing this. Um, but it all gives a little bit of marketing to the yeah. nonprofit. It beautifies the space. It's a win for so everybody. So this is a space that they collect um, the water overflow. And it's just, it, I, we should do like a before and after because before it was just like a, you know, eyesore. And then our kids came in with West Side Welding. And this is a, the paper airplane is what you guys call it. Yeah, it's actually a sundial. So you can tell time by it but it's mm -hmm. also out there and that's three tons of steel that was fabricated. So this thing isn't going anywhere. Yeah. And it's a mark that they'll carry for life. Mm -hmm. and, and we absolutely, and I don't know if the slide does it justice, but if you check out the website, you can get a little bit closer to On it. On our website, we have a link to all the public art. And then the next one I believe is, is it Carolina Bridge? Yes. So this is another one. And this is in combination with the city of El Paso's MCAT or our public arts department. This is a hundred foot steel, 19, uh, no, a hundred feet wide, 
nine foot high, and this is painted steel that's then fabricated and put on both sides uh, of the bridge. Both sides of the bridge, so wow. it's a tunnel. And this is another mark that our kids made. Mm -hmm. And this is spray paint, street art. It's uh, giving the kids again that that great purpose of knowing that they're good enough and what they can do. And it also showcases what the talent is here from our kids mm -hmm. and what we do at Creative Kids. So, so we were able to build this right before the pandemic. So, oh my goodness! I mean, that's amazing because then they can. It, it's you know they walk out and they're like, "Hey, I helped make that." You yep. know, that's awesome. How did you, I have to ask because I work and I'm not saying, by the way, let me put this disclaimer out here. If anybody's online, I'm not saying anything about government officials or about people who work in, in government offices, but I have dealt with many over my uh, last two decades. And sometimes I find, and this has just been my experience. Sometimes they can be a little like, no, we're not going to do that. Or what, you know, you want to paint this. This is supposed to be our our thing. How did you get them to, to work with you to allow, I can't even imagine walking in their office and saying, yeah, we, we want some kids, we're going to help them and they're going to do this. And I can just see a government official being like, uh, no, you know, so how did, how did you get them to do that? I have to tell you that it's, it's about having a strategy and finding out what your partner's pain is. And a lot of these things that we get in the public art are dealing with government officials because they, they also have a structure that they have to fit to, right? So what we try to do is collaborate, but we also come up with a way that everybody feels good about the project. So the way that we did the Carolina Bridge was like, I know this is a blight space. I know you guys want to beautify it. What it, and I see you're putting out an RFP. Would you, would you entrust us with that? And we come up with concepts. We do the hard work at the beginning so sure. that the conversation and the management of the project is totally clear that everybody knows what their outcome is, what you're accountable for. And I think it, it takes away that friction, but it's a lot about pre-planning and it's about smaller conversations that really get to the point where everybody feels good about their involvement in the project. Yeah. And there are situations where you have to just kind of be prepared to take a no, but mm -hmm. I go in always positive with thinking this is, this is gonna be good. And even if they come back with, uh, sorry, can't do it. Well, can we do it again? Is there a possibility that I come back with your concerns? You have to be not only proactive, but persistent. And it's important to keep your mind and your mindset to be open to hearing the negative as well as the positive. So you just got to deal with the bad, you know? That, I mean, what a positive outtake on that. I'm going to I'm going to propose that you guys do a workshop on how to get uh, officials like that to approve things, because I, I could definitely use, use that. And I think some other folks on the line might be able to use it. It's great. So, so what's going on here? I'm sorry. Because I think that's a really good question. You know, El Paso has been very good to us mm -hmm. and they've seen what we've done and they really have supported us throughout, you know, the journey and the nonprofit. And I think it's just really communicating and collaborating and meeting people. And just saying, hey, I don't know if you know who we are. But that added up to this mural. And this one's by the Chamber of Commerce. And this one is a thousand feet that's nine feet high. And another area that was an old water duct used for the railway. But now it's what we call the pedestrian pathway, which leads you downtown into the arts district. Mm -hmm. And that was another great project that our kids did. Uh, and again, that's on our website. You can see actually the time lapse. Of that's a better, yeah. And there's different angles, but it's so cool because it's three dimensional. And as you pivot around it, you get a new perspective every time. And I you just walk. saw quickly in the chat. I think someone wanted to know what the meaning or the symbolic meaning of it was. Yeah. So for us, it was about a lot that happens on the border and the uplifting strength of a woman, how they hold the family together and the relationship of nature and how you go through a drought in the desert and you don't have water. And then suddenly you get good luck that the rain comes. So this is all significant to the desert in El Paso. And if you see these piñatas at the top, remember that because there's a sculptural piece that's gonna connect this. So, so this is one element. This was the visual mural. But we and then can, if you walk about what, 15, 20 feet? About 20 underneath feet. Underneath the bridge, I think if the next slide should have the piñatas. So these are fabricated out of steel and then were powder coated. And the idea of that was then developed with the kids in the process, but it's got LED light. 
So like a chandelier in your dining room, this thing shoots out at seven o'clock and lights it up with cash shadow. Yeah. But those are all uh, 1,500 pounds a piece that are attached to the underhanging of a bridge. So these are in the register that they show at MCAT as one of the sculptures that you should go and see in El Paso when you visit. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So it, it does bring to mind though, and actually Brent put this in the chat, you know, I know all of your art is student focused, student centric. So working with materials like this, you know, steel of this nature, fabricated steel and, and dealing with the various pieces, these are things that we usually think of, you know, like professional artists, like, you know, like long in the industry for a long time. So can you kind of describe, you know, the scope of how like the students have worked in this, you know, how, how truly involved are they in it? As we develop, it, one of the things that I did when I graduated from the university is my professors would say, okay, you're ready. And then you go out in the world. Well, I wasn't. I didn't know how to work with engineers or architects or how fabricators of steel work. So they walk through it. They visit all the, the areas, what we're, material we're gonna use, why we're choosing that design, what color theories are we using, how you communicate and organize everybody. And this is leadership that we're teaching. It's not about the fabrication of the art. It's how do you do that? So they have a concept at somewhere in middle school already. How do I work to make something? Of it? And as they start positioning themselves to look at either being an architect, a film designer, they can understand that collaboration and coordinating people and working through the, the ideas, not once, but going over this brainstorming session of coming up with the best solution for the artwork Mm -hmm. That's when we engage with students. So as we make the work, they might not be doing fabricating of the steel, but they are behind the concept, behind the, 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 designs. the design and the color theory and everything that's involved in the final piece. But they also can connect A to B to get to the finish line and be successful. And they know the things that go into it to make that happen. Like the Carolina Bridge that was fabricated by Westside Welding. And then they brought in those sheets. I mean, the gallery is 16,000 square feet. So we had it all laid out and they spent months and months hand painting that. Um, so that was that was their touch on there um, with spray paint and automotive paint and all kinds of And paint it's paint. also saying, I don't like that. And then coming up with a solution because the main thing that happens is when you put a, p a pencil to paper, you're making 30,000 decisions. And this was developed by NASA. So if, if they can do that and go through their concepts and work through solutions, not only do they improve, but they understand that it's not just coming up with one idea, it's coming up with multiple ways to solve a solution. And so that builds a person that's a problem solver and a thinker. Um, so these public art pieces are, not only our community, but the kids giving input. That's the Playa Drain Trail. Um, we did 13 mural, uh, murals that are actually on tile. Um, they serve as mile markers in the ground um, for a new trail down in the lower valley. And so that's just one of 13. And this was with school teachers or art teachers in the school districts locally that all worked with us to develop with their kids what they thought would be a good image. And then we organize what the trail layout would be, where their area would be. Here's the tile that's gonna be done. This is the process. And they strategically laid out time in their classroom to achieve it. I was in the Isleta School District. Yeah, and we're thankful to them too for mm -hmm. being a part of it. That's amazing. So let me ask you, so what age of kids do you work with? Is it like, when I see a piece like this, I'm like, oh my gosh, that, you know, they must be high school, right? But is that true? No, really. I don't like to push kids that are four to seven. I like them to grow. So that's what we call our, our little Picassos. Once okay. you go above seven and you've been with us for a while and we know each other, then it's about up in the ante and it's about the trust and the relationship. Then I'm pushing you to excel in your drawing, better at your painting. I'm making it accountable for you to come back and practice. You have your own portfolio. You're working on your, your personal art, what you're assigned to do what's in your sketchbook. And then I think as you start getting a little bit higher in that relationship, you get the opportunity to work on public art art pieces. It's another mural by the History Museum. So that it's earned, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta put in your effort. You gotta show me you care. You gotta show me that you're ready for it. 
and then you get the reward of, of being a part of it because you've, you've proved that you're willing to work, that you're dedicated and you have passion towards the project. And those are things you need in life. And then next year, if we talk again, we'll have another one added to our portfolio for the new El Paso Children's Museum that's being built. And so Steve's working with our kids from the Residency Art Program to develop, is it seven? Yeah, we're doing alabrijes, which is a symbol that we use on the border for yeah. our dream animals, you know? And so this is gonna be out of Aluna. And I'll, I'll, maybe you'll invite me back and I'll show you it in the museum one of these days. But it'll be good. I'm really excited. Summer 2022 about it. should go in. 2022. If we can get steel, there's a steel shortage in the United States. A little bit of a problem. <laughs> but oh we'll, no. We'll, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Say, maybe we can do something. But it's so amazing. You have so many of these public art projects. You could almost put together landmarkers and like start a touring group, you know, and have kids give tours. I mean, that would be amazing. I'm already thinking. I mean, I go to El Paso about twice a year. Uh, for various training. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I got to like landmark these and go see them all next time I'm down there. Cause, uh, and, and El Paso is a beautiful community. So that's, you know, yeah. great. That's Rick, a good but, idea. I, I never thought about that, but I'm going to put that on the website. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> it, would, it would be awesome. I mean, I'd love to do it. So, so Brent asked another question, you know, and um, I'm going to go ahead and ask this while I get our video, I believe set up. So I'm going to take us off share while I get that going on. But Brent asked this, and that is, how do you support the earning process along the way? Um, you know, like what sort of SEL skills uh, development do you emphasize? What frameworks of resilience do you provide that kind of, you know, provide that buffer for hard times? I mean, there's hard times now, but you also, even before the pandemic, you were working with some pretty, uh, uh, some kids who probably on the ACE scale are very high who have gone through some significant trauma, you know, so how do you, you know, buffer the hard times for kids, the hard financial times as well to get kids in your program and to really earn, you know, kind of all of it, the whole aspect of your program. Well, I what I articulated that right. Well, yeah, yeah. What I've learned is I, I just can't be fake. I have to be real. And so you can feel energy from kids, you know, and there's trust issues. So my first thing is about the relationship. I'm there to hear about you, not about me, not about the process, not about the program. I want to hear about you. And if you can develop that, that is the beginning of a great relationship. That's when you get people to listen and really want to participate. But if you go in with, okay, here's the program, we're going to do this, this is what you need to do, that's not going to develop anything for that person to feel a part of something and that they matter. So the first thing that we do is we develop a, a, a really just good conversation. Do you even want to be here? No. Well, let me show you around first. Do you feel like it? Let me tell you what we do. Do you like this? Do you like that? And I'm going to do the same thing that we do to the kids when they arrive here or when they participate in our satellite programs. It's all about communication and management and feeling the truth between the relationship. And that's how you get people to say, I'm committed and I wanna be here. That's how we don't have a lot of behavior issues with our kids because the respect is there for them and for us. And we're all here together, we're on the same boat. And that's, that's what we try to establish is that we're here to have a good time. We're mm -hmm. here to learn something. We're here to be productive. And we always start with our four, the way we behave, diligent, kind, collaborative, and genuine. And so we use that with our staff, with our parents and the kids that are involved. Um, and that's what we start off with our kind of our core values. And this is who we are and how we behave within this organization. And we really don't have a lot of kids that, I mean, every once in a while, you know, but mainly the kids that are participating with us, they're there and they, we know them until they graduate high school. I mean, they just love it. Or they move on to ballet or they go to soccer or whatever. But the time we spent, I think, was constructive and it helped them out of a bad space sometimes. And it gave them a new space. And I always tell people we're not art therapists, but art is therapy. And so mm -hmm. you know, working, especially like working with the Resiliency Art Program, we don't deep dive in like, let's talk about what happened August 3rd. A lot of that stuff comes out naturally. You'll see in their artwork or they'll confide in one of the, the instructors. And um, But we're not there to like you know, 
tell us everything that's happening in your life. And I think they, they get that trust and that bond and then things start to come out naturally and we okay. move from there and we can, we're able to, uh, you know, refer them to their navigator on special services they might need or things like that. And the other component is, is letting the parents know where we're coming from and having meetings set up to talk to them because they got to know, I love your kid too. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do the best here. And if we work together, it's going to come out as a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think having the parents on board, the students knowing we, we care, and not only about the, the artwork or the process, but them personally, I think that makes everybody just a little more positive and more productive. And that's why we get these great outcomes because people care, you know? And it's that's so amazing. It's so amazing that you bring that up just because I work for a research company and I'm, I'm listening to a lot of a lot of talk out there about we need to make up the last year like we need to get kids caught up so we're going to double their workload and there's this idea of accelerated learning which i think is great we do need to accelerate learning but i think we're trying to push it like in warp drive and what you just said about showing the parents and the kids that you care i have to remind everybody the number one research out there around learning like is whether a student feels whether their instructor or an, a caring adult is there who really values them as a student. And I think everybody needs to remember that because, you know, we have all these interventions, we have all these academic programs, but it really boils down to, does the student even feel we care about them and we care about their growth? And it sounds like you've really embedded that. And I know we have a, a about a four minute video here, documentary that we want to show. Do you guys want to provide a little context before I hit play? Sure, this is um, Project Able Art Brokers Learning Experiences, and this is in um, rural Fabin, which is about 45 miles outside of El Paso. Um, and it's important to note Creative Kids is the only after school program in the Fabens community. Uh, there's about 1,200 students, um, and so we saw that need about eight years ago, um, probably longer actually, about 10 years ago. And uh, Again, what was supposed to be one summer, we're still there because the need is so great. Um, and so you, this will give you a, a, a brief overview of what we do after school in summer. All right, well, here we go. We started to look at the environment that these kids in Fabens were living in, and we realized that there was absolutely no after-school programming in that community. So the only thing they had um, was their school and any kind of formalized sports at the school. So doing the research and realizing there was absolutely nothing for these kids to go to after 3.30 uh, really propelled us to get something done and do the work to, to really make an impact in that community. Symmetry is the same on all sides. So if you look at all the corners, all the corners are the same, right? All four sides, and so if we were to cut it in half. A lot of these kids don't have a whole lot of options after school or just during the day, whether it's because their parents are working or you know they're not able to really make a whole lot happen. But when they come to our studios, they're able to really have a good time and just kind of escape from both any problems or challenges that are going on at home or also at school. Who knows what they'd be doing? Who knows where they'd be? Like a lot of these kids, I don't even know if their families know where they are. Like they say like, yeah, my mom knows where I am, but you see them after class and they're kind of just wandering around. So they could be anywhere. Okay, so what I want everybody to do is you're each gonna grab a tile and then you're gonna get a paper from me and then you're gonna get it taped on and then we're gonna go outside and let it burn in the sun. Este programa está muy completo. A mí me gusta porque los niños han, yo los veo que les han desarrollado las técnicas de color, este, técnicas de dibujo. 
eh, se han vuelto más creativos. I think uh, once they create a piece of art that they're proud of or are able to write a song on their own, completely freestyle their own music, they have a newfound sense of confidence. You get to show stuff to your family and you could tell them that you did that and that it means a lot to do art. What we were able to do was connect the parents back with their kids on making stuff and really getting them to be more patient about how they were making stuff, how they were talking with their kids, and giving the older kids opportunities to mentor some of these younger kids too. I feel like this program makes a difference because it gives them a safe place to be. It gives them fun activities to do. I feel like they genuinely get excited doing it and they get confident when they learn something new and they can take it elsewhere. So. When we work in these communities, we affect the whole community by allowing all of them to come in and be a part of it. So it's not really meant for just one kind of kid. It's really open to the entire community and getting them all involved into it. Because if we can get on the parents' side, then the kids are for sure to come and all of those bonds just become a lot stronger. Okay, so if you, I know we're getting close on time, Sean, so help me so I can do your tour for you. Uh, no, I'm so sorry. This happened to us last time too. You guys have such great, I'm usually really spot on making sure we're right on time, but you guys have such, so much stuff I just want to explore. Um, we, we do have that other video. Did you want to show that later? Yeah, and then I'll zip through with you if you just bear with me and I'll well, take you around. Maybe we'll show the video so it gives context of what this um, exhibit is about and that's another it's a short one again four minutes and then we'll give you guys the fastest gallery tour of your life i'll do a brisk walk <laughs> we'll get you out and i would say this too if for those on the line if you absolutely have to go at the hour we totally understand but i think we might we might only be like about five minutes over you know by the time we do everything so if you can spare five more minutes of your day to really engage with us we'd appreciate that but if not this is recorded and you can check it out and go to go to that last five minutes and see uh what our wrap up is but uh it's just such great stuff i don't want to miss out on everything uh because you're doing great work in el paso you're, you're doing great work nationally and so as recognized by the obama administration for you know so let's show this video. Uh, did you guys want to set some context for it? Uh, uh, for those it's going to be part of the yeah. tour that we show. The, for those the that don't know what happened to our community August 3rd, um, 2019, there was a gunman that decided um, to take out as many lives as Hispanic lives um, as he could. And so on August 3rd at that morning, went into a Walmart. And sadly, we lost 23 um, El Pasoans. Hmm. So uh, this so, is a response to uh, tragedy and we're working with the community that is directly and indirectly affected. And it's generously underwritten by the United Way and the United Family Resiliency Center. And so every Saturday for the past, and of course we had to launch it during a pandemic. So every Saturday, um, these kids, and I should mention not only kids, the, the um, response was so overwhelming that adults that were directly affected inside that Walmart has to be a part of it. And so now we are serving the adults. We are at max capacity, like waiting list beyond. And so um, the video, you'll just see a quick, it's some of the families are involved. And then the tour that Steve will give you, this is the work that the families have been doing for the past year and a half. And we have to mention it's on Zoom. So you can see the power of what can happen with dedicated teaching artists. And, and also a good team like Gabby and Adi yeah. that made that happen. So, so. So this is a, just a quick uh, video, and then we'll give you the tour of the actual exhibit that's up right now that we did for the anniversary of August 3rd. Okay. participants from the adult program and um, this 
program is called the RAP program, Resiliency Art Program, and it was created after the um, tragedy of August 3rd. And so the people that we're serving here are people that were directly and indirectly affected by that tragedy. I'm the wife of my husband who was shot and killed in Walmart August 3rd, and she thought this would help me take my mind off it a little bit. What the Family Residency Center did is uh, we coordinate with them and um, they reach out to the community and we have been serving kids as creative kids this is mostly what we serve and this is the first time actually that we started serving adults because uh, the family CLC center told us they had a really high demand on adults wanting the same uh, services that we were offering the kids and creative kids is a great resource uh, within the community that provides a place of respite and creativity for people who were affected uh, not just by that but by like uh, under underprivileged populations uh, and it is a really good outlet for uh, kids and now adults with us to, uh, to be able to express themselves in a safe environment. It's, uh, it's a therapeutic process in which they can explore their feelings, their emotions, but not necessarily directly, but indirectly through art. Uh, I love it. They always talk about doing like self-care and taking time for yourself. And when they offered up the program, I decided to try it out and it's been a relaxing experience and fun to learn new things. Oh, I've never had any art classes before this. This was my first time taking art. I think I've always been a little scared too because I've never been really good at art. Um, so I just went ahead and tried it. I, how I start a class is I uh, give examples. If we are learning about a specific artist, I like to start the class by talking about the artist and talking about the methods and uh, whether it was paintings or drawings, that's how I start my class. I don't go straight into the drawing or straight into the painting. I like to give a little bit of background of what the lesson plan is going to be. What we focus on is on art skills, like mixing paint, teaching them about proportion, teaching them how to draw. And also, most importantly, we teach them about art history, which um, we believe that are all these skills are skills that they will be able to take on whatever they decide to do. Okay, we're not trying to just make artists, we're teaching art, but all these skills that they're learning here, they're gonna be able to take them somewhere else. Do some math, okay? Taking art classes and creative kids, it's like a creative outlet. I get to express myself on a canvas. It's a great way to expand all you know. It teaches you a lot. Um, it was really helpful. I've improved in a lot of different techniques and um, I think it was a really good decision to join. Por el momento estamos ofreciendo clases virtuales solamente. Nuestras clases de arte sirven como terapia y también ayudan a desarrollar habilidades que se pueden usar en el futuro, como historia del arte, geografía, proporción, matemáticas y composición. Do we like the program, Creative Crates? Yes, we do. We're very much in love with it, right? Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a very important part of their life. Is it something that we like? Yes. Do we want it to continue forever? Yes, right? It's a very, very good program. We're very happy with it. They make it interesting. They make it fun. They make it um, exciting. Um, even though he's small and she's um, 13, they both interact with the teachers, they both have fun in class. I believe that what they're doing for the community is incredible. Um, I think that Steven and Andrea have come together and are doing incredible things and I wish that more people were able to take, take up this opportunity and um, we're just very thankful for y no podemos hacer nada más que dar gracias a que este programa existe y recomendárselo a todas las personas, decirles que no es solo arte lo que enseñan, enseñan a tomar decisiones, enseñan a expresar todas sus emociones. Es, es un programa maravilloso.
Wow. So much, so much good stuff there. But now we get to actually take a quick and not going to do it justice, but still uh, a little tour, right? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to switch to the iPhone here. So give us a minute and we'll be right back. Sure, no problem. For everybody on the line, um, what's happening now is uh, Andrea and Steven are transitioning over to their iPhone where they're actually going to walk us through uh, the gallery and show us different pieces, show us um, the safe space, show us a little bit about their program. So here we go. Let me spotlight them so that they can pop up there. Add spotlight. All right. So can you see can you see me? Are we good? We can see you, yeah. All right, so this is one of the pieces that's done with cut paper. And one of the things that I love about it is it's also a collaborative with the Boys and Girls Club that we did this summer. And this program was exhibited like you saw there. We show all our friends and family what the outcome is and it brings us all together. This is another collaborative piece here that we did with the same cut paper strategy, just a different image. And it involves not only collaboration and the leadership, but again, us coming together. Now, to come with me, I'm going to go fast, okay? <laughs> Our space is 15,000 square feet. Here's some of the self portraits that are dealing with wine and also composition, but it's more about the feeling and expression that happens in this. Let me show you the little guys over here. This is a group of sculptures. Now, these are all done with my four to sevens that we call the little Picassos. Yeah. And they went through the idea of negative shape, how to create a sculpture, how it's three-dimensional, color theory. And then these are their animals that they, they came up with. Let me walk to the front here. This one over here is just made from cut paper bags that they assembled. It was shipped to their house. They picked up their material. When it all came back, it created a three-dimensional sculpture. But each individual combined again, everybody coming together. Here's some of the paintings and drawings. So this is an ink wash on wood that's kind of idealized what the desert is out here. And each kid was given the material and the concepts and curriculum to achieve it. This again is just some work on canvas with mixed media and work in the sense of doing a still life. Here's some landscapes that we did with oil pastel that we have. Let me take you over this way. These are the old ideas of the Mexican tiles. We reinvented it with the clay pot. And then adding the idea of putting a bird, which is a symbol of freedom, each one of the kids that was working with our staff came up with their own idea to create these sculptures. And I think they came out really cool. The kids loved them. Now, over here, just real quickly, we also have a culinary program. And if you look at it, I'm going to light it up a little bit. We also teach about the art of cooking because we find it, it's a good way to teach kids about just eating healthy, being healthy, more energy. And actually, this is the next public art work. This is kind of what we're building, but there'll be six feet in height. And this is all out of aluminum steel. So you were asking earlier how we come up with the concepts and how we generate this input from the kids. Here's the mock-ups and the models of what then we're going to produce in a larger scale that they're going to work on and make it happen. And if you see the deer here, it's going to be a large installation. And hopefully you guys will come down and I'll pass it to see it. Yeah. But let me take you downstairs. This one is also a mixed media uh, work. And it's dealing with the idea of depth and field, also in pattern and color. And I like this installation a whole lot. Uh, it's been in the kitchen for a while. And it just, every time I see it, I love it. Uh, let's go down to it. So, if you guys come with me, I'm going fast. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So we're, we took it off camera because we're going downstairs and Andre and Steven didn't want like a Blair Witch Project situation going on. So, uh, 
So now I'm downstairs, it's are. a whole new level. Let me take you into the little Picasso studio. Now we have these at our different satellite sites, whether it's in the hospital or after school programming. And what we're teaching the kids is not only about art history. So let me show you the timeline. Each one of the kids is getting the idea in the periods of art, the movements that were made. But then they learn about where the artists live, what language they speak, and what they're known for in their own style. And from that, they're getting a university education at four to seven years of age. So we've been doing this online, but when they all come back in January, they're gonna be in this studio creating. They go through photography, three-dimensional work, line work, the principles of art, but we're interwining the other skill sets, such as geography, mathematics, and literature to make them a well-rounded kid that knows what they like, and knows about the world. So let me take you to another spot down the hall. So let me show you, we're also, we also have a dark room. So we do a lot of photography and silk screen. So when we come back, we're gonna set out a new set of t-shirts and maybe skateboards, I don't know, whatever the kids come up with. But this is another area of medium. It teaches discipline because sometimes when you work with photography, it doesn't come out the way you make it. So it takes patience and that's a good thing to learn. Now, some of our adults also went through the program. You can see this is what they're generating, but this was for a different purpose. It wasn't to learn about art. It was to take a moment to not think about anything and just do something constructive to make themselves happy and also give them somewhere to go for themselves. And I think that this is what that program provided. This is some of their work. But let me take you this way. You follow me. I'm going quick. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where art and technology meet. We have our own digital lab. We even have a setup that we're creating for the future for podcasts and for influencers that want to go that way. There's video editing, and this lab has 3D printing quality. You can do a 3D print, learn about that skill set. You can do Photoshop and Illustrator and all of these. But behind that, that's what our staff and what we're doing to get to the Learn Upon platform that we've created to help teachers and organizations to move with our curriculum and hopefully help more kids to succeed through the skill set that we've developed. Um, and this is where I think the future is going, is to reach as many students and as many people as we can with the mission we serve. And that's just the quick tour of the gallery. But if you're ever in town, you can always email me. I'm happy to show you around. Come visit us in El Paso. Let me take you uh, this way. These are also some of the objects and sculptures that we made. So this one's a giant iron. Right. And this is all made out of cardboard, but it's somebody's symbol um, that's kind of a family thing here in El Paso, La Plancha. Um, up here is cut paper and work that we've done. And I guess that's the quick, quick tour. <laughs> Let me uh, go back upstairs so that we can have a little questions if anybody has any. But you're always welcome to call us, email us. We'll have our contact info here at the end. We will. But if anybody has any questions in the chat, I'm going to go back into the laptop and we will answer those. And we can even look a little bit into the platform maybe next time or call us when you can. Let me go back and say. All right. So, Dre, if you want to go. So I think uh, they're transitioning back to um, transitioning back to a laptop here. So they'll be right with us. We're probably going to be about uh, three to five minutes over. I apologize. We do have one more thing we want to ask uh, Andre and Stephen. So please bear with us. If you absolutely have to go, we understand. So okay, let's spotlight them. Get them back up here. Sorry, guys. It's a little chaotic, but. No, I'm surprised you, you're still able to chat. Like that was a quick, I would be out of breath and not able to, to talk for a little while. You guys. That's... I'm trying to get my steps in, you know what I mean? <laughs>
<laughs> so, well, uh, that was beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So, we, we do have a question in the chat um, uh, from Sulima. I, I hope I said the name correctly. Um, if you're back, you know, if you're back in January, let's say, you know, kind of like what COVID safety guidelines are you kind of putting in place? And uh, are your teachers willing to meet in person? And I know you shared with me in our in our call uh, last week a little bit about some of the challenges you've had with the various you know aspects of you know staffing. What we're all going through across the country right now with staffing, but in particular around COVID and the pandemic and how it's really affecting you. So we're developing documents that we're sending out to our parents. We're sending it out to any of our partners to kind of create this understanding of, of respect because I have staff members that don't feel comfortable. I have kids that still need protection. So it's in the benefit of everybody to understand that we're not just doing it for us, we're doing it for you. And we're communicating that to all our partners. Hopefully if anybody has uh, a certain situation that they'll call us and feel comfortable about talking about it. And we're just making, you know, all the protocols that we did in the pandemic, keep going forward, wash your hands. You know, if you don't feel good, don't come to class. And that goes for our staff, any of our partner, anybody we're working with, because I just don't want to feel the responsibility of not being proactive. And I think it's just the right thing to do so that we're all good and safe. And I know our staff will, we will continue to wear masks um, as we teach. Uh, we're gonna encourage the participants that do come through to wear their masks. We realize we can't uh, mandate that, but we are asking, as like Steve said, as mutual respect so that we can do this in person. Um, otherwise, you know, we're gonna have to take two steps back again. And we're also hoping by then, you know, the vaccine they are now seeing next Friday um, should be happening for our young kids. So that's another reason we picked January. There might be some more um, herd immunity as they're calling it. And I'm, I'm putting it in the position of teaching the kids a good lesson. It's not always about you. You got to care about somebody else. Right. You know, right. so we're trying to make this a thing that they understand a meaning they can take through life as a lesson and just showing them mutual respect. You, you treat people the way you want to be treated. And so I was taught that and I think it's a good thing to pass on. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Just for context for everybody on the line who's not from Texas, Texas has a statewide uh, no mask mandate through executive order from our governor. So um, no organization or business in Texas can actually, so to speak, mandate. And there's, there's various uh, aspects of that. And I won't get into the whole political aspect of all that, right? But I appreciate you know, the take that Stephen and Andrea are taking here, you know, it's really about thinking about other people and what's right for the community and what's right for them. And that is uh, being a great example, wearing masks, you know, as a courtesy if needed, following the science, you know, and doing what's right for kids uh, because we serve kids. So thank you. Um, gosh, we are at time, but I know I want to highlight this because I think this is such an innovative idea, something that everybody could also replicate. Uh, uh, this is a way to basically bring the concepts and everything that we've, we've seen today kind of into your homes, into your communities, into your organizations. Tell us a little bit, maybe, you know, the brief like kind of elevator speech within, you know, a, a long elevator um, <laughs> speech about what is this lead platform? What does this mean? Well, it started off, you know, it took 20 years to develop this secret recipe that we've created. And we think we found the right one, but in order to reach more kids, we need to partner with more areas in the nation. We need to collaborate more. We need to learn from each other. And so this platform is not only for educational systems, but for the partnership of nonprofits and a community at a whole to take our tools and apply them. And this is leadership being taught, it's art skills, it's combining the skill sets that they need to learn to be with success and good outcomes. So we've developed something that it's a course outline mm -hmm. where educators and, and our students go through and they learn not only the curriculum of developing art, but we're teaching mathematics and literature and, and history through it. And we're gonna be launching it. And this was all learned in the pandemic we actually decided to go in this direction of becoming a curriculum developer 
because we saw the potential. We were able to get a generous grant from the Trellis Foundation and the Paso Norte Health Foundation to help migrate everything we've done in the past 20 plus years onto this platform. And so in January, we'll be able to roll this out. It will be a subscription-based um, platform, self-paced. You go in, there's all these really great um, modules and curriculum um, that you can take. And if you need to, as a teacher, we are certified through the Texas Education Agency to give CPE credits. Um, so yeah, in January, we'll be ready to actually release this to the world. We're super excited. It's been a year and a half of and lots of fun. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest from also school systems to implement this to give teachers another skill set to reach their kid as they're going through the day. That's a visual, that's hands-on, that's about leadership. So we're we're really excited. And it also works in the after school space because we have all these great curriculum um, modules that you can use with your kids in your after school programming. And we're trying to get those two things to merge. We want the entire day to be geared around the kids, not only after school, but in school. They need it more than ever. And at the more mentors and the more people that we surround the kids with and the more tools we provide, we learned that this platform could help others and we're going to reach more kids with our mission. So that's where we're going next. And we're excited. We're looking forward to it. And uh, that slide gives you all the info to call us or let us know that you're interested, or if you have another question, we're here to help. Well, and I just have to say, thank you so much. I know we're a little over time and for everybody, I do apologize. Um, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to go back to uh, the Beyond School Hours conference website and the foundation's website. There are links on both that will lead you back to the perspective shows. You can also revisit um, kind of past shows or actually uh, past visits, like our, our past visit and our discussion. There is so much more that we were unable to fit into this hour, but uh, I am pleased to say that Andre and Stephen will be at the Beyond School Hours Conference in Orlando, Florida in February, the end of February. You can talk to them directly there. You can uh, go to the Perspective Show because they will be uh, participating in the Perspective Show where we will be digging in with other uh, guests of the show, various aspects of how to use art and literacy to change, uh, honestly, to change the world, you know, and to use positive thinking, positive uh, outreach to kids and to empower kids to, you know, change the world too, you know, and that's what you're doing in El Paso. So many takeaways. I, I'm telling you, we're going to put a workshop together about how to talk to public officials to do what you're doing down there. Um, I know Folks here will have lots of questions, but we are at time. So I'm going to switch my slide deck here real quick. I'm going to transition by taking off and give uh, Andre and Steven just real quick one final moment to kind of give a, a, a final thought before I turn it back to Elizabeth. Well, I'm thankful you invited us and I hope more people like give us a call. You know that we can do more and be better together. So we're here. Call us. And Sean, I can't tell you how great it is to see you again and give us this opportunity. So I'm thankful to you and the panel that was with us and everybody here today. So that's my well, turn. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody taking time. This is a crazy, crazy time, right? But for you to take an hour and 10 minutes out of your time to spend with us, that is so appreciative. And while we were kind of a small group of what I call warriors of light, people who want to make a difference in the world, because I think that's what you are. Um, Please spread the word. They can watch this uh, on any of the social outlets that um, Perspectives and Foundations is on. Elizabeth, I think that kind of wrapped us up today. Okay, perfect. She's given a thumbs up. So um, I'll just close out real quick if that's okay then. I just want to remind everybody, <laughs> just want to remind everybody uh, that we are grateful to be able to do this show. And our sponsor, basically, who helps us do the show is the Charles S. Mott Foundation. And the Charles uh, Stewart Mott Foundation has been such a supporter of after school, about art, about literacy, about everything that we've talked about today. And we're so very grateful that they are a foundation with others that support the same initiatives that actually put their dollars where it makes a difference with kids. There is no better foundation than that. You know, we wanna remind you, of course, please attend our live show. Great thing about the live show is when it's over, 
we don't end the Zoom call. You can actually come up and talk to us and grab a drink or hang out or, or you know, actually visit with us. So please see us in Orlando at the Beyond School Hours conference. I do have to say the early bird for Beyond School Hours is closing. So make sure you get that deadline. Try to register and uh, get that deadline before the price goes up. Yeah, not too much, but a little. So if you want to save some bucks, uh, that's a great way, but it's a great value. It's, uh, you know, basically from... Uh, Wednesday night all the way to Saturday midday of PAC professional learning. Um, and it's amazing. So we hope you'll join us. And then also don't forget, you know, we love some social media. We love you to spread the news. And so our basic channels are, of course, uh, Twitter and Facebook. This has been live streamed. YouTube, uh, Jude has been posting things there. So has Paula about how you can join us. We have webinars every Wednesday, and we will have more Perspectives webinars coming up in November and December with various artists. So very, very excited. I think, Elizabeth, did I cover it all? Okay. Okay. She's shaking her head, so I'm just making sure. Paula, Jude, anything from your side? All, all right. Well, then, everybody. Andre Steven, everybody who joined us, thank you. Have a great day. And hey, happy Halloween, everyone. See you later. All right. Well, I'm going to go to go ahead and close us out, Andre and Stephen. But thank you so much. We appreciate you, man. That thank was great. Know. I'm sorry that the tour was so kind of packed, but it's beautiful. And you know, I'm going to bring a film crew down. We're going to we're going to see your studio in depth and do some really cool shots. I, I don't know when I'm going to plan it, but spring. Uh, expect to see me in El Paso. I plan to come down. We're ready. Okay. <laughs> sounds good. We'll see you then. And appreciate it. Uh, all right. All right. And thank your thank your helpers too because they were great with phone and and <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But yeah, All right, we'll see you Take soon. Care. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Paula.